Trudy, how are you on this, this fine, glorious day? Very nice, thank you. Looks pretty nice outside. That's gorgeous. I was surprised in those last two chapters to find out Israel armed China. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that one kind of threw me. <laughs> At Kissinger's suggestion. At Kissinger's, I missed that. What? Wasn't that, I think that was- uh, I might've missed that part. Yeah, I think uh, we'll, we'll look at it, but I think it's uh, because the Chinese were having trouble with- with um, Japan. With, with the Vietnamese. Oh, the Vietnamese, okay. With the Vietnamese and they needed uh, to deal with, uh, with, with tanks. And uh, as I remember the, the, the section, they- um, uh, they turned to the Americans and asked how they can, uh, if they can get some help with dealing with with uh, with tanks. And uh, the U.S. said no way. And Kissinger said, "Well, you want to know who's dealt well with tanks? Talk to the Israelis." Wow. But why'd they do it? For money? Um, I think you know it. Um, Israel today has relations with, with a number of countries, but there was a time not that long ago when Israel was desperate for relations with anybody, um, you know, and uh, uh, so they've developed relations with, uh, with Putin and Russia. They've developed relations, you know, they'll take relations wherever they can get them. And certainly a trade, um, uh, the biggest thing that Israel trades is technology. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it used to be, you probably remember, they used to deal in oranges. Oh, so long ago. So long ago. Then they dealt in flowers, international flowers. Um, they don't do that anymore. They don't do oranges at all? I don't think so. Wow. I don't think so. Um, yeah, I remember. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Elaine, and can see you too. You have, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I remember seeing Israeli oranges for sale in England when we were there. Mm -hmm. Wow. And they were, they were real delicacy at the time. That was a while ago. Well, one of the things that Israel could do um, was, and that, that wasn't oranges, but uh, Israel could produce um, uh, uh, produce um, through the winter. Yeah, that was the idea, right? Um, and because they, uh, yeah. uh, as a matter of fact, I remember going to a here, to a, a settlement on the banks of the Dead Sea, um, where they were soaking the land. There you go. Uh, because it was so salty. They had to soak it and soak it and salt it. So, uh, but the land was, was terrific for uh, growing things out of season because it was so warm. Do they still do that? Uh, I think so. It, what, the name of the kibbutz, it's interesting. It was a, um, a, a labor kibbutz. Um, it wasn't Keturah. No. Uh, it was a late labor kibbutz, and we asked them what would happen if there was peace, and they said, well, if the Israeli government, you know, that's a big issue. If the Israeli government makes peace, so we'll pick up and we'll leave. We'll leave? We'll leave, right. That's that. Um... Were they on occupied land? Yeah. By the Dead Sea? Uh, yeah. Um where is it occupied by the Dead Sea? I guess I missed that when we were there. Uh, well, it was was still up in up in the hills. Um, oh. you know, in order to get to the Dead Sea, usually go uh, east from from Jerusalem down to Jericho and then south. Mm -hmm. um, I think we went from Masada. Uh, I remember from Masada, yes. But you have to get to Masada. Right, right. Uh, oh. and in order to get to Masada, unless you go really all the way around. Um, you really go have to go through the West Bank. Well, of course, it's been a while, but yeah. Well, could we talk about a, a possible uh, program for classes when we resume? Sure. Yeah. Do you have Do you have any suggestions? Well, I wrote to you earlier, you may not, about a book called "Walking the Bible." That's always intrigued me, and 
I assumed it was the Torah, not the whole Old Testament and New Testament. But every day, this author took it upon himself for a year to walk on biblical, walk to biblical sites. Do you know anything about that? I know of the book. I have not read it. Um, I thought it would be interesting for us. So, uh, um, yeah, you know, one of the, uh, one of the, 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 the issues, one of the problems is, of course, that uh, we really have no archaeological evidence of anything. Um, <laughs> uh, until after David, after King David. So there's no archaeological evidence of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's no archaeological evidence of Moses. There's no archaeological evidence of, of, uh, of, of Joshua or the period of the judges or even um, uh, the, the uh, uh, King Saul or King David. Um, so it's only, um, only after uh, some time later that we have any. So a lot of things are, are speculative, you know, that we, uh, we uh, one of the places that, uh, that you, can, you can visit, of course, is the Valley of Elah, which is where evidently David confronted Goliath. Um, now, is there any evidence that, that this, this um, uh, took place? Uh, no, um, but uh, so I have, I, I'll look at it. I'll, I'll walk in the Bible. Um, I can't remember who's the, who's the fellow. Um, let me see, walking the Bible. Uh, yeah, it's Bruce Feiler. Um, all right, I'm, I'm, I will order it and take a look. Uh, walk a journey by land <laughs> in five books of Moses. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, we also talked about the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds. Uh, As a comparison. Yeah, there are a number of, of, of books about the Rothschilds. Um, one is, a, one is a, a pretty scholarly two volume. No. Uh, <laughs> and then there's then there's um, the one about how the Rothschilds really got started, um, starting in in uh, in the ghetto in Frankfurt um, with the Amschel uh, Amschel uh, Rothschild, who becomes the father of these uh, five sons that he sends in different directions. But what what's interesting, I think, about the Rothschilds um, is that there are many similarities to what, what are the kinds of family dynamics that we, we saw in, um, in the Sessions and especially the Kaduris. If they didn't deal in opium, let's hope. They did <laughs> not deal, deal in, in, um, in opium, but I'm not sure that everything they did was so uh, up, uh, above board either. By the way, the Kaduris never, never dealt in, in opium. Only the, only the Sessions dealt in, in, um, in opium. Um, so are there any Kadori's Sassoon's, oh, well, I'm going to say alive today, but yes, yes, yes. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I looked up, we'll get to that, um, that um, Lawrence's son is named Michael. Yeah. Michael is, is uh, will be 80 in July. He is married to a Cuban woman, Betty Tobayo. They have four, ch four children, one son and three daughters. Um, the oldest son is named Philip. He's 29. And, um, you know, they are still big uh, entrepreneurs in Hong Kong and in China. Um, uh, you know, we, we've been to Hong Kong, but I... I did not see that, or not notice, or look for the Peninsula Hotel. I, 
Um, That's we've, the, the, we've, we've been to the Peninsula Hotel in Hong Kong. We have not been to the Peninsula mm -hmm. Hotel in Shanghai. Well, what a, I, what about, I have my commentator next to me. What <laughs> about, can I bring up another isn't question? There someone who is very active, I was going to say in design, in, in women's design, in clothing. That's not the same family. It's not the uh, same. Well, he know. says very clearly in the end of the book that the that the hairdresser, yes, um, Sassoon, is not is not a relative. Um, and is the Hebrew they speak? Uh, is that Ashkenazic Hebrew or Sephardic Hebrew? Sephardic. What are we talking about in Israel? No, to, well, to themselves. You said they speak Hebrew at one time. Uh, they yeah, were well, they were Sephardic, weren't they? Yeah. yeah. That's why I'm asking. Right. Um, <laughs> can I ask? I would question, assume it would be this part here. Phil. Last week you mentioned that the only two countries that accepted the Jews were Dominican Republic and Cuba. Okay. We know that there are large Jewish community in Mexico of Jewish refugees from Europe. But the question I have is, if that was the case, particularly with Cuba, how come they turned, they, they turned away the St. Louis? Uh, not only did they turn away, my aunt was on evidently a ship uh, that left Hamburg uh, went, came to, uh, was was given no um, no port of entry. Uh, it was not the St. Louis. I don't know. I have to, I have to call my uh, my cousin and find out if if she knows better. But and the ship went all the way back to Hamburg. Oh. From Hamburg, my aunt uh, went down to uh, went back down to Bavaria to the town where um, her mother still was, and together my aunt and my grandmother, uh, my grandfather had passed away um, and is buried in this in the town of Aschaffenburg, but they made their way uh, to uh, to Italy and um, and got on a ship ship in Italy. But she was on it on one of the so it's not evidently there was more than one boat that um, was not given yeah. was not given. Oh, yeah. So you're asking why why they didn't give the um, I, I don't know the answer to that. And maybe they were only open for, for a certain period of time. But I know yeah, that, they, right. that they were open. And I don't remember the timing of, um, I'll, have to, I'll look that up. I'll yeah, look that I, up. Had, I had a college classmate who, who actually grew up in Cuba as a, as a refugee. Hmm. So just, just share with you that uh, I get a call this week from a uh, uh, somebody that I went to high school with, um, I wasn't wasn't a, a a close friend, but this is somebody who, um, and I and we went out to lunch uh, this this week, um, and um, so he he uh, he tells me that his grandfather. Uh, his his uh, his grandfather was a rabbi in Shanghai, um, and came came to California, and he was the the first rabbi of this congregation that Ted Alexander, who I knew, um, uh, became succeeded him. Um, so it's a so uh, he's been he's been to to uh, uh, to Shanghai. And it, I didn't even know that this, cla this classmate of mine was Jewish. Um, and the reason that he called me yeah. was because uh, last Friday evening, he went, he came to Neve Shalom. Uh, and there, <laughs> there he saw my name. Uh, and, that was the, um, and that was the reason. He also, by the way, I have to send Fred and the whole staff a, uh, a, a note because he was attracted by, although he had belonged to a reform synagogue, he was attracted by our Neve Shalom web, website. He got there and Joanne welcomed, uh, welcomed him. 
He loved the service. It was warm. It was welcoming. People talked to him. I felt so good about his, his, um, his reaction about coming to, as a stranger, walking into, uh, walking into Never Shalom. So I have to give, um, uh, so he, he has, uh, uh, so this, this classmate has, um, you know, I talked with him about, about this book that we're reading. He, you know, his, um, his family uh, came, through, um, came through Shanghai. Um, so our chapter is called, what is it called? The, uh, the Last Taipans? Is that, is that what the name of, that of was the, one uh, of them. yeah, the next to last. And the, the uh, right, that is called the, um, the last, anybody know what a Taipan is? No. <laughs> he doesn't explain what a Taipan is. No. <laughs> well, look up the word Taipan and you know what you'll find? Nothing. The word, it means snake. Snake. <gasps> snake. Like the animal. Um, it's also used, obviously, pejoratively for a tycoon, yeah. uh -huh. uh, a wealthy and powerful business person, especially, um, uh, especially a foreign, um, uh, uh, a foreign person, person man living and operating in Hong Kong or China. But the word is, so this is really a disparaging term for, um, for these foreigners who, um, uh, who lived in in uh, in Hong Kong? Um, any uh, any observations about uh, about these last two chapters? Now that we finished the book, thoughts? Anyone? Uh, was it really? What is the title of the book? The Last Kings of mm -hmm. The Last Kings of Shanghai. I I don't relate to that. As okay. Um, obviously, you know, they, they, these, these foreigners and these two families in particular, but they weren't the only ones, uh, they behaved like kings, uh, in, in, um, in Shanghai, certainly until the communists took over. They become a little, a little more, um, humble. Um, the Kadoris do. <laughs> the Kadoris do. That's, that's right. That's right. Victor never goes back. Yeah, he fled. Uh, uh, he fled. He goes to Bermuda, uh, but there are still um, um, members of his family that are around. He does. He doesn't have any children, uh, Victor. Um, but uh, and I don't know about um, uh, about more of them. Um, um, you know, it's it's really interesting how uh, history bounces. About, uh, they react to to all the history that's going on around them. First, they leave Baghdad. Then they come to India, and David becomes uncomfortable uh, uncomfortable with um, Gandhi um, because Gandhi is a is a nationalist and uh, and. Uh, and uh, as far as he's concerned, a, a communist. Um, so then he comes to um, uh, he comes to to China, and uh, things things go well. But eventually, he's he's got to deal with uh, you know they are oblivious to really to to the Chinese. Um, they're they're dealing with the, the changing laws after the first Opium War and then the second Opium War. Um, the second Opium War, of course, was what what uh, ended legal opium, uh, but uh, gave Hong Kong to, um, uh, to the British. Um, and then he has to deal with the, um, uh, with the Japanese. He's got to deal with that. They've got to deal with the nationalists. They've got to deal with the Chinese. Um, they, uh, they go to Hong Kong and they're afraid of the, of the Japan, they're afraid of the Chinese um, uh, invading. Um, uh, they're, they're afraid of, of, of 1993 when the, when the British are going to leave. Um, so, you know, uh, all these international things are influencing um, how, they, how they live and how they, how they prosper, these Taipans, uh, these snakes, um, these uh, international business people. 
Um, but they, you know, they they have a golden touch. You know, they they. Uh, I mean, how would you go about uh, electrifying China? Uh, <laughs> um, um, any other any other any other thoughts? I found it interesting that the Chinese, even when they didn't want foreigners, they were under underground kind of wanted that wanted what they did so it was just wasn't public they so need they, they needed, they needed it. They, yeah. they, right they needed entrepreneurs and yeah. so they used hong kong yeah uh and the reason it appears that my impression is the reason they didn't invade hong kong is because it was much more valuable this way mm. uh, that they could function uh, in relation to uh, to Hong Kong, uh, until it was going to be turned over to them uh, by uh, by international agreement. Uh, yeah, um, and you really have the have the sense um, Mao made a mess. <laughs> Mao made a huge huge mess. The Cultural Revolution, and uh, uh, so it's uh, uh, at least according to Jonathan Kaufman, it's Deng Xiaoping who really creates a modern, uh, modern China. Um, and um, and uh, he really says that, uh, that that visit by Nixon changed everything. Uh, now there are actually different views about this, this, um, um, this visit by Nixon. Some, you know, our general view is that it was Kissinger and Nixon initiated. And uh, I've read several articles recently that really they were responding to, um, uh, they, they were pressured by the Chinese um, to, um, uh, to, to, uh, to come. Um, uh, uh, Trudy pointed out the, uh, the story about the tanks. Right, would you find that interesting that the, um, mm. uh, where was that? Um, it's in the, not the last chapter, the chapter before, I believe. Uh, it is, um, I made myself a, a note. Um, and uh, uh, even before we get to the tanks, this uh, little incident, 1967, 1967, where um, Lawrence is on the board of the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, and they go ahead and they buy an Arab bank, the Bank of the Middle East, and they demand that Lawrence be kicked off the board. Um, then he buys a bank. Uh, and interesting that it's actually 1967, which of course is the, the year of the Six Day War. Um, and he leaves. He leaves the um, leaves the board, um, right? He becomes a, a knight. He becomes a member of the House of Lords. Um, um, uh, uh, interesting that um, uh, he one of the reasons that the Chinese deal with him is he never says a negative word about the Chinese. He never criticizes the Chinese. He doesn't criticize Tiananmen Square when we have still to this day have no idea how many people were killed in, the, um, in Tiananmen Square. Um, but what, what, what does he use the, uh, his position in the House of Lords to do? Remember in this, in this chapter? That the British are terrified that in 1993, they will have huge immigration. People are gonna leave Hong Kong and they're gonna to come to Great Britain. So they pass a law that says that the British citizens of Hong Kong may not come to Great Britain. Uh, <laughs> in other words, they are second class British citizens, not first class British citizens. And he uh, stands up in the House of Lords and he uh, is, uh, is against, he's, uh, right, he's um, uh, he's Baron Kaduri of uh, Kowloon and Hong Kong in the city of Westminster. 
um, uh, um, when I see this uh, Baron Kaduri, um, uh, Carol and I were, were in Paris and we were, I think, at the Photography Museum. And in the Photography Museum, there is a bust of which, uh, which Rothschild? I don't remember which, which Rothschild. Uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of, of one of the uh, Rothschilds. Because it was his house. Oh, it had been, right. It had been a Rothschild house where the museum is. And this is a bust of, 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 uh, of the owner, of, of the, a former owner of the house. Uh, and there's just a janitor, um, the custodian, who's cleaning up around it. So <laughs> Carol says, uh, to him, is that Rothschild? To which the janitor is sort of indignant and he looks and he put, puts his hand out to the, uh, he says, Le Baron? <laughs> this, how, how do you just call him Rothschild? He's Le Baron? This is Baron Rothschild. <laughs> um, um, that's why we have a clause in our constitution about titles. We okay. Um, we do. I didn't realize that we have a, cl a clause in the um, in in the constitution about uh, about titles. Cannot accept foreign titles. Uh huh. Um, there was a little incident with Michael Blumenthal. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. Michael Blumenthal, sort of, sort of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Blumenthal, who is the Treasury Secretary, comes to comes to Shanghai, and he starts talking to them in the Shanghai dialect of Chinese. Wow! Which uh, yeah. sort of bowls them over. Uh, yeah, Bruce, Bruce, you're you're uh, um, you're muted. Did you want to? Uh... Yes, I, I found that uh, one of the more interesting things in that chapter. And then he says, uh, I want to see the uh, Hong Q. And they say, not possible. Not possible. He says, I'll show you. <laughs> and he takes them there and said, and evidently you just have this image. He points upstairs to that apartment. He says, you see that apartment there? That in this slum? That's where I lived. Um, that's where I. That's where I grew up. Um, um, and there's. Uh, whoops, I lost everybody. I think you can probably see me, but I can't see you. Uh, now what do I do here? Um, goodness. Um, you are all there, I, I suspect. <laughs> You're all here. <laughs> You're all there. Wait a minute. Let me Save get yourself. out of this because I don't know what to do. Wait a minute. Well. Um, okay. Uh, I'm trying to get in again. Do you have a camera at the very bottom row on your screen in blue? That's yeah. Video? Hit on that because I've had that happen. If I get a phone call in the middle of a Zoom, it blocks out my Zoom. I have to go back down to the very bottom and hit the camera, and then it makes it come back again. Well, I've gone to launch back to launch meeting. Oh, come on. Well, any of it. You, you can you can hear me. That's uh, that's the uh, the most. Um. Um. So, uh, you know, uh, but they, he, um, Lawrence doesn't get frightened. Um, uh, uh, he, uh, you know, goes ahead and builds this building. The, uh, what was it called? The St. George. Mm -hmm. um, even so, it's probably a bad investment. In 1993, it probably would have been the right thing to pack up and leave. And he doesn't pack up and leave. He, um, he stays there. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's really quite interesting. No, I'm not getting back to you guys. What, what am I doing here? Come on. I thought it was interesting that he went back and found the people who worked for him. Yes. 
Uh, give them big hugs. I, it's just a whole different relationship than I can picture with the Sassoons. Um, yes. Um, I am, I'm frustrated here and I'm going to, I'm going to forget it. You have I'm not, a, I'm not going to forget you. At the very bottom of the screen, across the bottom strip, yeah, next I'm, to the word "leave." But I'm not, I'm not there anymore. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> well, we can see you and hear you. Okay, mm -hmm. I guess that's the most important thing. Yeah. Um. So. Um, so where do we go from here? Well, let's wait. Uh, well, what I, what I, um, uh, uh, what I wanted to do first, I think was um, on page 291, was it 291? I think 291, if you, have, if you have your book there, I thought his evaluation was really very interesting. Um, 291, certainly both families were the beneficiaries of empire and colonialism. The opium trade that was the foundation of the Sassoon fortune had destroyed the lives of millions. The fortunes made by the Sassoons and the Kadoris were built on low wages and unfair competition. They exacerbated inequality that left Chinese dying in the streets of Shanghai. Even as the Kadoris danced at Marble Hall and Victor Sassoon provide, presided over his extravagant parties at the Cathay Hotel. They fueled the rise of the Chinese Communist Party. It's an interesting. In other words, they, they, they were responsible. They fueled the rise of the Chinese Communist Party and its triumph. Uh, this is quite an indictment. The Sassoons and the Kadoris exploited Shanghai, but they also ignited an economic boom that attracted the wrongs and millions of others who found the city a place to pursue their entrepreneurial dreams as China uh, wrenched itself from a sclerotic feudal society into a modern industrial one. It was the Chinese who transformed Shanghai and China. The Sassoons and Kadoris helped light the fuse. At a time when much of the world, including China, is building a physical, political, and cyber walls to limit immigration and the free flow of people, ideas, and information, there is a lesson in Shanghai. The Sassoons were in many ways the first globalists. You heard that term before, globalists? No. It's a right wing. It's a right winger term, and it's an anti Semitic term. Uh, yep. Uh, you know, Jews are globalists. We have no no national loyalties anywhere. This is really an anti Semitic canard. Um, so, if you see the word globalist, just put next to it anti Semitic. Um, so he's he he says here the Sassoons were in many ways the first globalists. Their experience foreshadowed the problems and anger that globalization would bring in later decades. Inequality in Shanghai was a scourge that radicalized the Chinese, helped bring the communists to power, and decimated the fortunes and moral credibility of both families. The Kaduri family had long been active in charity. In the aftermath of the communist revolu revolution, Lawrence and Horace recognized even more the importance of education, health care, and housing and helping refugees, even when their chauvinism and patriotism uh, masked for many the progressive impact uh, of what they were doing. Um, uh, and uh, I think it goes on. So this, that's, I think that's quite, uh, quite an interesting indictment of, um, uh, of them. Uh, any any, uh, any um, thoughts about that? Are you there? Well, yeah. you're there. I don't see any. Oh, you say we have the Baron in England, but other than that, they didn't really cross the sea into well, certainly not the United States, but not even England. So they maintained their presence in China, or or China uh, occupied uh, territory. Even to today, do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, but I'm not sure I understand what you're what well, you're asking. What I'm saying is, 
they weren't globalists. They were orientalists, if, if you want to coin the term. Well, you know, I, I would guess globalist in the sense, in a couple of senses. Number one, they were never loyal to China. They were loyal to Britain. They were, um, you know, they, they uh, uh, although uh, Ellie had difficulty getting British citizenship and got it only through his wife, um, uh, that's where their loyalty was. And then they invested everywhere. Uh, they invested in Australia. They invested in South America. They invested. Um, what and, about here, United States? I don't know if they invested here in the United States. No. Um, so uh, the sun, the sun is, I mentioned this a little bit before, uh, before we started this, the um, uh, Lawrence's son, uh, Horace that never marries, I don't think. But Lawrence uh, has a son named Michael. And Michael is more in line with his uncle, with Horace, than with his father. Today, Michael is already, in this July, Michael will already be 80 years old. So he is uh, Lawrence's son. La when, you remember when Lawrence died? Lawrence yeah, died. Oh, in, right. What's that? Was it 1965? Was Lawrence the one who went to? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm mixing him up with Victor in the Bahamas. Sorry. Right. No, La Lawrence dies in 1993, just before um, the, uh, the, the, the uh, changeover. Oh. Um, and um, he's, um, he's in his 90s. Uh, and before they connect this uh, nuclear power plant. So he, never, right. never he dies that. in Hang, Hong Kong. He dies, he dies in Hong Kong. That's yeah. right. And both he and his brother dies two years later. And they are buried, they are buried in Hong Kong. Um, so if you're there, you can go to, if you go to Hong Kong, you can go to the cemetery and, and see their graves. Which we do uh, not do. Michael is, uh, Michael the son is married to a woman named Betty Tabayo, who's Cuban. Now, I, uh, I'm just making an assumption that uh, Michael's wife is not Jewish, but I don't know. Um, they have four children, one son named Philip and three daughters. Um, and uh, Philip is, is 29 or 30. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, the Kaduris are still worth about 10, 10 to $11 billion. Uh, that's, that's quite a chunk of change. And where is he living? Uh, I, I think he's, I think uh, Michael is living in Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, overseeing, uh, overseeing the, the peninsula um, oh, the, the overseeing the hotel chain. Um, gee, this is really frustrating. I can't see you. I probably made a, made a mistake going. All right, I've gone back to try and get into Zoom and it won't let me in. No. Um, okay. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's, um, uh, it's quite a story. And, uh, I think that, um, you know, we, um, um, I'm glad that Jonathan Kaufman wrote, uh, wrote this study, uh, because we would not have known anything about, um, uh, about them. Um, and they, and, uh, Interesting that um, that Lawrence wants to go back to China. He wants to go back to, to China. He dies. He dies. He is he's in a wheelchair. He's uh, has severe arthritis. And yes, it's um, August 25th, 1993. That he dies at the age of 90, 94. Um, uh, so um, uh, here we have these these um, two two families and. Uh, and they really end up in very different places uh, where the Kadoris, Kadoris are still um, quite powerful people. Um, and um, uh, I think it said at one point, point that uh, Michael, the, the son, um, is on the hotel board um, 
uh, and um, uh, because he 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 liked the hotel business and he found the uh, electricity business, which it was mo where most of their money came from, he found it boring. So who's running it? The uh, there's a there's a there's there's a board. He do they, they, own, do they still own it? They own a percent. Oh. They own a percent of this uh, of uh, of of this uh, of this business. Um, so right, we we said here that um, uh, uh, when um, even after 1983, uh, everything that they owned increased in, in value. They are today the tenth richest family in Asia, uh, and um, he uh, Kaufman says that they are. Uh, worth 18 billion dollars but i think it's less um oh gee, oh, gee right um uh and uh, interestingly that the the chinese uh who really hated um um uh, these interlopers um they've now um uh, honored victor with a portrait in his restored suite um the Kadoris, as I said, opened the peninsula in uh, in Shanghai. Um, they call Hong Kyu a Jewish Disneyland. I, I got to tell you, I've been to Hong Kyu. I don't think it's a, of an, it's a Jewish Disneyland. Um, but there's, um, interestingly, they say that uh, at the Jewish Museum, this I remember, at the Jewish Museum, which was which was a synagogue, they have a, uh, a plaque that's devoted to um, Ho Feng Shen. You remember who Ho was? Who was the guy in um, in Austria who was writing um, right. visas? Right. Uh, and then he mentioned Sugihara. People familiar with the name Sugihara? Mm -hmm. Sugihara was doing the same thing in Lithuania. Uh, and I think I mentioned last time that um, uh, uh, Devorah Wilhelm's family. Um, who were from Lithuania, they got out of Lithuania because of one of Sugihara's um, visas. But, the, uh, but they don't honor Sugihara in, uh, in Shanghai. Why? Because he's Japanese. Yep. Oh. Um, and they don't, they don't like, uh, you know, there's still this, this issue um, as a matter of fact, I was surprised that that in in China there are Japanese cars because um, there's still uh, real the Japanese uh, tourists. and and a lot of Japanese tourists as well. Um, okay. And did uh, Chinese tourists um, go to Japan too? Don't they? Uh, I don't know. Not? I don't. I you know I should know that, but I don't. Yeah, I don't, I don't, um, uh, I don't, I don't know that. Um, I'll have to check that out. Um, so um, in terms of, of thoughts of, of what we might do in, in the fall, um, we have, we have two, two suggestions. One was um, uh, the book Walking the Bible, uh, which I don't know anything about. I've, I've seen it. Um, but here is an effort by the author to go to the places that are mentioned in the Torah uh, and to imagine that the events, um, how the events took, took place. That's what I, uh, so that's one. And the, another suggestion was uh, to do a book um, about the Rothschilds. Um, uh, I'm open to, um, to, to other suggestions or to opinions about those two suggestions. Tell us what you're talking about as far as when class would resume. Rosh Hashanah. Well, Rosh Hashanah is very early this year. I think it's like almost Labor Day weekend. Yes, it's, it uh, is. It's like the 6th of September. Uh, so we probably begin right after Yom Kippur. Did you have any ideas that you want to put forth? Uh, I uh, I have to do more more exploring in terms of what what are new books that were um, uh, that are that are that are coming out. 
Um, you've always are, been enchanted are, by the Rothschilds. Um, yeah, the Rothschilds is, is, uh, has been an, been an interest of, of mine. Um, several of the Rothschild, as a matter of fact, uh, the American embassy in Paris is a Rothschild building. Um, and where the ambassador lives, uh, we've been in, uh, uh, we got special permission to, uh, to go into that, that house. It's, uh, it, it's a big mansion and right across the front it has on the, on the gate, it has two huge R's. Uh, which I assume is from, is from Rothschild, and um, uh, which was which was one of their their many their many estates. Um, so I know more about the French Rothschilds, uh, who are quite famous. Probably the most famous are the British Rothschilds. Hmm. Um, um, just in case anybody is interested, uh, uh, the. Um, visitors from China to Japan okay. make up 30% right. of all international visitors to Japan. 10 million Chinese visited in 2019, uh, which is five times the number of Americans. And the reason that I brought that up is because when you have visitation back and forth between the countries, I think it improves the relationship and the understanding. And so maybe in China, the antipathy towards the Japanese might be lowering uh, because of that visitation that's going in both directions. Just tourism helps to bring peace to the world, my right. industry. So I just thought that might uh, have a, be a factor. Uh, what, I, what I might add is China was so poor and so controlled that, that it wasn't until you know, the last 20 or 25 years mm -hmm. that Chinese traveled altogether. Right. Yeah. Um, and when they traveled, they only traveled in uh, in groups where everybody wore the same uniform with uh, with a tour guide who had who, who, who you know who walked with a flag um, but that's but the old way that's the way it used to be 20 years ago but now you have young chinese who are very wealthy that's right and they travel on their own and they do all the hip stuff and they buy the 300 dollars jeans and they're um, out there with all their money because you know you have that four grandparents on one baby thing. So right. the, the young ones really are very, very savvy and um, rich and they travel and spend money and they go all over the world doing well, it. Well, not all Chinese are rich. I mean, there's a no, certain- I mean, the, the middle class. The class of, 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 of yeah. very rich, of very yeah. rich uh, Chinese. Well, we um, uh, um, and, um, but the, this whole thing, uh, I remember going to, um, to Disney World and the Chinese Pavilion. Have people been to the Chinese Pavilion this many, many years ago? It's a, it's a yes. theater in the round. Yes. You're talking about Beautiful. at Epcot? Uh, Epcot, at Epcot, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a theater in the round. And I, uh, you know, as I stood there and I watched a, uh, a Chinese father uh, with, his, uh, with his daughter on his shoulders, um, and I thought to myself, you know, th this is a, uh, they're doing a, uh, an ethnic tour and they are seeing more of China than hardly anybody in China because of this, um, the fact that, that uh, people uh, did not, um, uh, were not tourists, but, uh, but I think, Barbara, I think you're right that uh, the number of wealthy Chinese is uh, has grown so much that uh, they're doing, uh, they're exploding in terms of, um, yeah. of their, well, their yeah. tourism. The way that we learned about it um, when we studied the Chinese market for tourism development is if you take the population of China, uh, how many, whatever it is, and you'd say, well, there's a 10% group 10% of that population only has the money to travel. Well, 10% of China of whatever, billion. is more, more than any other market you know, in the world. Uh, the whole population of the United States right. or whatever is about 10%. So even if you talk about this emerging group that's small but mighty, their numbers are so huge that they make mm -hmm. a worldwide impact in um, spending on luxury brands and on, on tourism. Yeah, so you take 1.3 or 1.4 billion uh -huh. 
So 10% is 100, uh, 130, 140 million, uh, which their 10% um, is half the population of the United States. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's yeah. why everybody pursued the Chinese market. That's well, why I went to 40%. China so many times was for tourism development um, to work there. So uh -huh. get those Chinese to come to the United States. Get the Chinese to come here yeah. and, and they're a wonderful market. Uh -huh. I, I have a... Um... A marginally related Bruce, story. Could you, Bruce? You got to, you got to mute, mute yourself. He is unmuted. I no, oh. I'm unmuted. Oh, I thought you were talking on the phone. Oh, oh no, <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. I I have a marginally related story sure. about China. <clears throat> In um, 1997, I was chair of the uh, Speakers Bureau at Portland State. <clears throat> and we brought in several, uh, several top name speakers to you know, address our, uh, uh, our student body and uh, community. So I reached out to Chai Ling. Chai Ling was living in Boston at that time under the protection of the U.S. And Chai Ling was one of the people, uh, one of the two that initiated the Tiananmen Square uh, protests. Mm. Uh, she was scared and she came to the U.S. Her husband wanted to stay in China. So they clearly uh, were separated and she um, yeah, her talk was was quite good and you know she talked about the, the numerous aspects of of the protest and how um, how messy it got and a after the talk uh, we had a little reception <laughs> and, and this has nothing to do with it but it's kind of cute and Norm Winningstadt came up to me and said, Bruce, can I take uh, Chai Ling back to the airport? And I said, yeah, okay, sure. I was scheduled to do that. So the next day, Chai Ling calls me from Boston and she said, thank you so much for arranging my um, tour of, um, of the Columbia River Gorge. I said, what? What? He said, oh, you didn't know? Well, we went to the top of this bank building where uh, Mr. Winningstad had his helicopter. Oh. And he took me on a tour of the gorge and then, uh, you know, landed me at the airport. What? So she, she had, <laughs> I had no idea. I did too. But that was Norm. <laughs> Interesting stuff. Wow. And she's still living in the U.S. Uh -huh. Did her husband ever leave? No. Huh? Yes, you know, uh, the, this Tiananmen Square, the only image that we have left is this single guy standing in front of a tank. Uh, everybody remember that? Um, uh, but, you know, I don't know that we ever got a sense of how brutal the Chinese were in Tiananmen oh. Square. And uh, how many thousands of, of, uh, of people um, um, were uh, both brutalized and killed? Yeah. Um, I mean, it was really, um, it was really something. Yeah, the Chinese made their point. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, um, and um, uh, Lawrence, um, you know, in, in strong criticism, he never, he was dealing with the Chinese. He never said anything about it. Never criticized them. Never, uh, but he's a businessman. Um, and uh, to criticize the Chinese would have been bad for business. He would, he would have been next. Well, he was in Hong Kong. Um, you know, I, I don't think that he was he was uh, in danger uh, like he was when the uh, when the communists took over. Um, um, 
it's uh, well, it's a it's an interesting story. So why don't uh, everybody uh, keep your eye out for something that looks really interesting that we could might do as a group, and I will um, keep you all informed as to where, where we are and uh, and when we'll start again in um, when we'll start again in September. So I want to wish everybody a um, a wonderful. Um, uh, time did I? I don't know. Did I share with with you uh, my uh, last weekend in July? My um, mm. no. The no. Um, uh, when I first came to Portland, a uh, woman showed showed up uh, in my office with her eight year old, uh, and uh, she had just recently gotten divorced from a um, from a judge in the Virgin Islands. And uh, she said to me, I want to convert to Judaism and I want to put my child in religious school. I haven't shared this with you. Okay, no. so let me tell you the story. No. I want to put my child in religious school. At the time I sent her to Sylvia Perlman to get the child registered for religious school. And Sylvia uh, calls me and she says, uh, we can't do it. I said, what are you talking about? She said, well, in order to put a child in religious school, you have to, they have, we have to have a member of the, uh, the parent has to be a member of the synagogue. In this case, no parent is Jewish and therefore no parent can be a member of the synagogue. Um, and we can't put the child in religious school. Yeah. And I remember um, saying to yeah. Sylvia, Sylvia, that's ridiculous. Put the child in religious school and we'll figure this out later. Well, for what, however she did it, we put, uh, made an exception. Uh, this child was put in uh, in religious school, and the mother a mother and daughter converted to Judaism. Um, the child had her had a bat mitzvah. I think in the meantime, the father uh, came came here from from the Virgin Islands. Um, the child, this young young person, took her Judaism very very seriously. She ended up, <laughs> ended up in Israel, um, went to a women's yeshiva. And on one of the tours that I, times I was in Israel, I uh, contacted her and while she was in this women's yeshiva and uh, she was happy as a clam. I also got a, a communication from her during the Iraq, um, during the, 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 um, uh, the bombing when everybody was getting, a, a, getting gas masks. And uh, because she wasn't a citizen, they didn't give her a gas mask. And she wrote a letter. She was sitting there crying when someone handed her handed her a copy of of Tehillim of Psalms. I don't know that 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 was any any that was coming for her. In any event, she uh, eventually marries a uh, young American religious fellow, um, and they are living with his uncle, either his uncle or his grandfather. Um, and one day they get a call from the Nobel committee that this uncle had just won the Nobel prize in economics. <laughs> um, and then they became his, um, his secretary, sending acknowledgements and thank yous, et cetera. He won the, um, um, for the Nobel for, um, in for, ga for in economics for, for game theory. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, she and her husband then um, go out on their own. They uh, get a um, an apartment in Modi'in. Uh, Modi'in uh, is a relatively new town, but it's now become a big town um, mm. between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. <laughs> and uh, I also visited her uh, in um, there with three. Uh, three or four little ones, um, and uh, and can they can hear me? I don't know what I've done, but I am concerned about the Zoom. Oh, um, re 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 recently, re you mute yourself. Blaine, oh, can you mute? Let's let's mute. move to the line. Bye. Okay, thanks. Uh, I recently got a call uh, um, from a mother saying um, they're looking for uh, for a Torah. Did I know where they could get a Torah? Because the daughter and her family were coming for the daughter's bat mitzvah. Granddaughter's for the for the for this daughter's bat mitzvah. Yeah, um, and uh, so I said, you know, I'm I, I don't know about borrowing a Torah. I contacted Rabbi Kosak. 
Rabbi Kosak's first thing was, we don't lend out uh, copies right. of the Torah. And finally, he got back to me after consulting with Fred and said, are you going to be there? So I said, well, I don't know. I haven't been invited. They said, if you're going to be there, you can take a Torah with you. <laughs> so now how do I go about inviting myself? <laughs> so I, I talk with them. And sure enough, they've made accommodations um, for me. The, the whole family is coming out to the beach, um, to the, uh, the, the, Oregon, the, the Oregon beach the last weekend in, in, in July, and we'll have a bat mitzvah. So uh, I talk with, um, with Chaya, and she said, uh, talk with her on the phone, and uh, she says that her daughter is going to read the entire Torah portion. I said, Chaya, I thought you were really orthodox. Uh, what's going on? She said, yeah, we are orthodox. <laughs> uh, but she said there's an increasing movement in Israel of egalitarian uh, egalitarian orthodox. Now, egalitarian is not what we call egalitarian. Egalitarian means that the parts of the service, like Friday night Kabbalah Shabbat, um, uh, parts of the service that don't have blessings, women can lead. They can also read from the Torah. They can also be called to the Torah. So, um, so I'm very excited about this event, the last weekend of July because it's such a, a, a long and wonderful story, starting with a woman coming with his eight-year-old and wanting to enroll her in religious school. Um, and now she's coming as a, as a mommy of um, her second child, which is, uh, who's, who's gonna be 13. Why are they doing it in Portland if they live in Israel? Uh, because grandma lives out, out by the beach. Ah. So they're, they're, coming, they're coming here to, um, uh, to, uh, to celebrate with, with grandma rather than doing the whole thing in Israel. Nice story. Yep. Yep. Nice story.